Hello everyone. This is Archit from Inside AI ML, and in today's video, we will see some of the common data science interview questions. Now, interview is one of the most important part of any job process. You talk to the HR or the technical guy who is going to judge you on the basis of your knowledge, and on that particular interview, you're going to get the job or not. Now, interview has so many sections. The guy or the interviewer can ask you many different kind of questions. They can be either in the technical field, they can be either in your personal questions, or they can be either some tech questions or some riddles just for getting to know how much you can think on the spot. Now, we'll go through most of the data science interview questions and then we'll see some of the trick questions in between, which generally comes inside an interview. So, let's get started. Very first question is going to be How is logistic regression done? Now, a logistic regression is a statistical modeling that is in its basic form uses a logistic function or also known as the sigmoid function to model a binary dependent variable. Now what logistic regression does is it's just going to take many independent variables and then give you a probability of either yes or a no. And how does it give the probability using the sigmoid function? As we know that the sigmoid functions formula is one by one plus e to the power of minus x so any number that you give inside x will be in between 0 to 1 which is the probability now after doing that we set a threshold value now why we set the threshold value because we want the answer to be either in 0 or 1 we do not even want the probability of it so we set a threshold value so that if the answer becomes a of the threshold we'll set it to 1 and if the answer becomes below the threshold we'll set it to 0 in this example, if the answer that you're getting is 0 0.8, we're going to set it to 1. And if the answer is you're getting is 0 0.3, you're going to set it to 0. The second question is how to build a decision tree. A decision tree is a flowchart like structure, which comes to a conclusion after asking some specific set of questions. Now, to build a decision tree, the very first thing that you have to take is to take the entire data set as input. And after taking the entire data set, you have to calculate the entropy of the target variable as well as the predictor attributes. Now, after calculating the entropy of the variables, you have to go and calculate the information gain of all the attributes. Now, after calculating all the information gain of all the attributes, you have to select the attribute which has the highest information gain. And then we're going to choose that particular attribute as the root node. Now you're going to repeat the same process each and every time till the decision node of each branch is finalized. Or you can say we reach to the leaf node for each and every end of the decision tree. Now, if you don't know about entropy or information gain, I'll highly suggest you to go and watch our decision tree video in which we have already explained what is entropy, what is information gain, how to calculate both of them and what is the formula for both of them. Now, we'll go to the next question, how a random forest is built. Now, a random forest are composed of multiple independent decision trees that are trained independently on a random subset of data. Now, as we know that the random forest is just a group of decision trees. So we just have to train number of decision trees, but on what particular data? On a bootstrap data. So the very first thing that you have to find is to select key features from the total of m features in the big or the whole data set and the condition is that the k should always be less than m now among the k features we make a random bootstrap data set and using that particular bootstrap data set we are going to train a decision tree so among the k features we calculate the node d that using the best split using the entropy and the information gain now after splitting the node using the best split we repeat the step two and three to complete that particular decision tree now one decision tree of a random forest is completed now you're going to repeat the step one till four n number of times to create n number of decision trees and the number of decision trees that you want in your random forest is the number of times you're going to repeat this particular step now, if you don't know how exactly random forest has been built, I'll suggest you to watch the random forest video in which we have already explained how the random forest is built, how bootstrap data has been figured out and 
how to build a decision tree using the bootstrap data set. Now we'll go to the next question. Now next question is a trick question. Now there are nine balls out of which one ball is heavy and the rest are of the same weight. In how many weighings you will find the heavy ball. Now to clarify the question, the question is asking how many number of times you're going to use a weighing scale to find the heavy ball. Now the correct answer of this particular question is two. Now to ex if you're going to say only the answer to the interviewer, he is not going to be impressed. You have to tell them how. So what you're going to do is that you get, you're going to do choose the first six blocks or you can say the first six balls and keep three balls in one side and the three balls in other side. Now they're going to be two situations. Either the heavy ball is going to be in either of the six balls that you have chosen to put in the weighing scale or either of the three, which are not put on the weighing scale. Let's take the first situation. The first situation is when the heavy ball is not in the six balls that you have used in the weighing scale. What will happen then? Then both the weighing scale will be completely balanced and you will figure out that neither of the balls are heavy. Now you understood that the three balls which are left with you are the heavy balls. Now to you, now you're going to do that. You're going to remove all the six balls and you're going to take two random balls out of the three and put it on one, one side of the weighing scale. Now, if both the wing, if the wing scale is completely balanced, it will figure out that the ball, which is left with us, which is not put on the weighing scale is the heavier ball. If not the side on which the weighing scale tilts is the heavier ball. So we figure out the way using to use of the weighing scale. Now taking the second condition in which the heavy ball is going to be in the six in initial balls that you have put on the weighing scale. Now, if there is a heavy ball in either of the six balls, the weighing scale is going to tilt on that particular direction. So we're going to choose that particular group of three balls on which the weighing scale has been tilted. And then we're going to take that particular three balls and then remove the other three balls from the other side of the weighing scale. And we're going to do the exact same thing that we did to the previous left out three balls. We're going to take two random balls out of this particular three balls and keep it in one, one side of the weighing scale. And if the weighing scale remains completely balanced, it means the ball, which is left with us is the heavy weight ball. And if the weighing scale tilted on when you one of the direction, it means that particular ball has been saved as the heaviest ball. So this is how you answer this particular question. Now let's go to the next question. What are the main features or the main methods of feature selection? Now let's see what is a feature selection. Feature selection is a process where you automatically or manually select those features which contribute most to your predictions variable or output in which you are interested in. Now feature scaling in a simple word is just deciding which feature you want to use in your model and which feature you do not. Now why we do that is there may be a chance that the answer that you're trying to find is not depending upon the, all the features that you're providing. Take an example, the height of a person will never be depending upon where he lives. So if you're trying to build a machine, which can predict the height of a person providing that particular machine in the training part as the person's address is not going to be any way helpful to you. So there are particularly two methods for feature selection. One is the filter method and other is the wrapper method. Now in filter method, you found out different algorithms, which can delete the, or you can say, remove the features from your data. They can be either LDA, ANOVA, a cheese square in which cheese square is one of the most popular and the most important one. And the other is a wrapper method in a wrapper method. There's a backward selection, a forward selection and a recursive feature elimination. Now in the filter and the wrapper method, filter methods are the one which is most commonly used because wrapper methods are computationally very, very expensive. As we can see forward selection is just like checking each and every feature with the model and the model output and figuring out which one is completely related to the 
outcome of the model. In backward selection, you train the whole feature and then go backwards and check which one is not necessary. In recursive feature elimination, this is one of the most computational heavy elimination in which the machine tries to figure out all the combinations possible between the independent variables and then try to figure out the dependent of that ind independent feature on the dependent feature. And it does it recursively till all the combinations has been checked. So it's a really heavy computation method. The next question is how to find the value of K in K means clustering. Now K means clustering is a clustering algorithm in which you specify the value of K or specify the value of clusters and the machine will find out that number of clusters into the given data set. It's a unsupervised learning technique. Now to find out the optimal value of K, you need something known as a WCSS or within some sum of squares, within clusters sum of squares. Now within clusters sum of squares is the distance of each data point in all the clusters to their respective centroid. Now you may imagine that if the numbers of clusters is less then the number of centroids has been less. So the within sum within cluster sum of squares will be high. And as you increase the number of clusters, the number of centroid increases. So the distance between all the data points and the centroid decreases. And what is going to be the end value? The end value will be when you will have one, one cluster for each and every data point that you have. If that particular situation happens in which each and every data point is considered as a single cluster, then the centroid and the cluster will be overlapping. So there is no distance between them. So the WCSS will go to zero. So the WCSS can be really high and it can go till zero. Now, what you have to do is that you have to try and find the WCSS to a range of numbers. It can be from one till whatever range of number you're trying to find out now. And then after finding out the WCSS, you plot the graph according to the number of clusters in the X axis and the WCSS on the Y axis. And then you try to find out an elbow method or the elbow point out after which the decreasing in the within cluster sum of squares reduces significantly. As you can see this example, the decrease in the WCSS from one to two is really high. And from two to three, it's really high. From three to four, it's considerable. But after four, the decrease in the WCSS is really, really low. So four becomes the optimal point or the elbow point. And that is the particular value of K that you have to use into your question. Now let's go to the next question. How you should handle the missing values. Now, if you're working with a real time data set or a real world data set, there is a high probability that you will come across something known as missing values. They are just unknown values in the data set, which you have no idea about. So there are two different ways in which you can handle the missing values. The very first thing is when the data set is huge. If the data set is huge and the number of missing values is less, what you can do is that you can completely delete the rows in which the missing values are present, or you can completely delete the instances in which the missing values are present. Now, this is a really simple technique and a really useful technique only if the data set is huge and the number of missing values are less. But if the data set is small or the number of missing values are large, then deleting this will delete a significant amount of your data set, which is not good. So if that's not the situation, we'll go for the next situation in which we can substitute the missing values using any of the techniques. Now to substitute the missing value, you can use many techniques. Either find the mean of the column and then substitute it or find the mode of the column, then substitute it. Or you can do a regression course or make a regression model to find the substituted model. There can be many things. If you find, try to find out the mean, you can use the data frame of the pandas using df.mean and you have an inbuilt function df.fillna, which is going to go to each and every missing values and replace it with whatever you provide it to. So this is how you handle the missing values. The next question is how you will find the Euclidean distance in Python. There are different kinds of distances that you can use. 
the most common is the equilibrium distance. Now the formula for equilibrium distance is P1 minus Q1 whole square plus P2 minus Q2 whole square and giving it an under root. So if we're taking two points, having plot one saved in a list with one three and plot two with saved in a list as two five. Now to find the equilibrium distance, we are going to apply the very same formula into this particular points using Python. So first thing is P1 minus Q1. So we are going to use plot one of zero minus plot two of zero and giving the square to it plus P2 minus Q2 whole square. So plot one of one and plot two of one, subtracting it and giving it a square. Now, after getting those two terms, you add those two terms and then give a square root to it. So the equilibrium distance stands in square root of plot one of zero minus plot two of zero to the power whole square plus plot two of plot one of one minus plot two of one to the power two. So this is how you find the equilibrium distance in Python. Now let's go to the next question. What is a recommender system? Now a recommender system or algorithm that is aimed at suggesting the relevant items to the user. It can be item that being movies to watch or the text to read or the products to buy or anything depending upon the industries. Till now you may have seen Netflix, Amazon Prime or Hotstar. What they do is depending upon what you see, they suggest you different movies or TV shows or web series. And you're most likely to like them because they're depend they completely work on what movies you like. Now, there are two different ways in which you can build a recommender system. They're content based filtering or collaborative filtering. Now in content based filtering, what happens is it's just going to depend upon how you rate the diff movies that you have seen. If you have seen more number of superhero movies, or if you have rated high to superhero movies, you're more likely to be suggested one more superhero movie. Now in collaborative filtering, they try to find out similar people. If there's a chance that there are two people and those two people liked five movies and then one of the people watched a sixth movie and he liked it, then the second person will get the suggestion of watching that particular sixth movie because all the users, which belongs to the same group has liked the movie. So this consider that even you will like it. So this is how content based filtering and collaborative filtering works. Now let's go to the next question. How to find the MSC and RMSC of a linear regression. Now MSC and RMSC are the error matrix that you try to find out when making a linear regression or any regression model. They tell you the exact changes or you can say the exact error of your model. As we cannot guess the accuracy of a model in a regression model. So MSE stands for mean squared error. So what exactly is a mean squared error? Mean squared error is found out with the formula one by n summation of i till the very n and y i minus y i hat whole square in which y i is the actual value and y i hat is a predicted value. So what it does is it's just going to find out the difference between the actual and the predicted value and do the square of this particular term and then find out all the actual and predicted value distance and doing the sum and do the whole summation and then divide it by the number of instances that you're working on. So this gives you the average error that you may find out in all the instances of the actual and the predicted one. Now you may think, why are we exactly doing the square there? Now we are doing the square in MSC to cancel out the negative points. So there can be a chance that your actual answer is three and your predicted answer is you can say zero. So this particular function will give you a value of minus three. Now taking a second equation in which the actual answer is three and the predicted is six. And in this particular situation, the answer you'll get is three. Now you may see 
that the actual answer is 3 and the predicted is in the very first option was 0 and the second one was 6. They are equally distant from each other. So in the model, they should say that they are equally bad. But one has an error of minus 3 and one has an error of 3. So to nullify the error, nullify the negative mark or you can say the neg negative symbol of the error, you use the square function. And then I've, after adding all these things, you just divided by the number of instances to do the average. Now, RMSC stands for root mean squared error. Root mean squared error is nothing new, but under root of MSC. Now you can see the formula that it has the exact formula of MSC, but an additional under root. Now, why are we using the under root? Now, there is a possibility that you want to tell your error in between a definite range. You do not want to tell an error of something like 50 or something like that. So you keep it into a small range so that even a small change in error can signify a good distance. So that's why we use root mean squared error. This comes to an end with this particular video. In the next videos, we will see some of the more questions on data science and their tricky answers. Till then, thank you.